Hey, David, how are you? I'm all right. Let me, uh, when does this work? Oh, yeah, there it is. So I met David McCraney uh, at Strata this year. I've been a longtime fan of his blog, You Are Not So Smart, and the book by the same name. Uh, he's got a great sense of humor, and he tends to look at the world through the lens of how we as humans make uh, bad decisions. But he does it in a kind of loving way because he recognizes that if we inherently make these bad decisions, even if we're aware of the kinds of biases that might affect us, um, we still need to kind of live in the real world where we are all people making those bad decisions and living our lives accordingly. Uh, so I got a chance to talk with David at Strata. I had some great conversations there and then uh, followed up with the interview you're about to see. A uh, really interesting guy. We talk about a bunch of things uh, from the Oculus Rift and whether Facebook is trying to innovate or just flailing around madly, uh, whether there is any way to predict the future or whether flailing around madly is a good strategy, and uh, some of the cognitive biases uh, that people are often subject to when they're making decisions. Many of these apply to large organizations trying to innovate, trying to understand where the future is going, um, and also the problem that you can't, as a leader, simply throw your hands up and go, we can't know the future, so we should do whatever we want. Uh, you do still need to try to have a model to understand where things are going uh, and what that means for the way that organizations that are successful of any size um, approach new problems, approach challenges they're facing. It's a very interesting interview. I'm glad I got a chance to talk to David. Hope you enjoy it. I believe there are lots and lots of reasons why intrapreneurs have a hard time. Mm -hmm. um, some of them are the capital cycle of large companies is annual, whereas you know your startup idea may last a week. Uh, some of them are tolerance for risk. Some of them are the fact that when you ask your the, the innovators' dilemma problem, you ask your biggest customers what they want, they say more of what you do now, better and cheaper, mm -hmm. as opposed to something different, right? Um, so I'll start with something topical. Facebook bought Oculus Rift <laughs> for $2 billion. Yeah. Is Facebook a large company that's thrashing around to try and figure out um, whether or not it's being disrupted? Why, why on earth would Facebook think it was in the VR business? Um, you know, I, I've read a lot of speculation and, you know, I like to boil it down to, uh, you know, these are human beings making human being decisions. And um, maybe maybe Facebook is seeing, looking into the future and seeing it, it wants to be like um, many of these other companies that um, they, the core thing that they were built to do is becoming something that is not uh, valued by society as much anymore, or it's becoming just incorporated into what we do as a society in many different little tiny ways. And um, to remain viable in the future, they start grabbing things that look like they're part of the future. And boy, does Oculus look like part of the future, right? Right. Um, and so maybe Facebook is like, we'll figure out down the line how that can be, how we can use all of our assets to plug into this thing, but there's no doubt that we should have this thing before anyone else does. Um, I think that's like the easiest way to look at it. Yeah, although, um, you know, three years ago, Facebook was like on the ropes because they didn't have a good mobile strategy, right? So right. it may be that Zuckerberg's already seen when people move from desktop to mobile, if we're not in the middle of that conversation, we are have an existential threat. Maybe he thinks that VR is the next existential threat. I don't know. It could be. I mean, uh, I won't, I mean, I know that it's impossible to predict the future and that we're really bad at it, but obviously there's going to be some leap in interface uh, that is going to make it easier for us to all hang out. Like, right, we're talking over a incredibly new technology right now, and it's just, I'm just doing it. We're just doing it. And it, what makes this technology work is that it doesn't add to or take away from what we do as human beings to communicate. It simply gets out of the way and lets the human thing that we evolved for millions of years happen the way it's supposed to happen. So I can gesture, I can look at you, I can talk, I can change the inflection of my voice. All the stuff that sucks about um, text interaction has been moved off the table. And I would it's reasonable to assume that virtual reality would take that and then instead of getting out of the way, it, it actually force, you know, amplifies and magnifies. Uh, I don't know if these are the kind of conversa conversations those guys are having, but uh, because I want to remain optimistic, <laughs> I, I want to assume that that's what they're saying to each other. Is like you want to believe that two billion dollars requires <laughs> rational thought, right? Yeah, you know, I would not like just to, Palmer Lucky's a really nice guy. I mean, I just 
it seems odd to be like, yeah, I mean, it doesn't seem like a, like a typical business decision to say, where can we, where can we put Farmville now? I know, uh, floating in space in your home. I just don't think that's, that doesn't seem like that's where the decision came from. Although if you uh, could get migrant workers and give them rakes, and convince <laughs> them it was a game. Right. There's so many things wrong with that statement. <laughs> but like, um, I mean, yeah, every dystopian uh, nightmare starts with some sort of weird, um, I, I read something recently about uh, you could, in the future, if virtual reality is, is, um, is perfected, and you combine it with like really good neuroscience that develops uh, top end drugs. Could you put somebody in prison for a million years right. in their mind? Like as a. Yeah. The, and, I think the most awkward thing, because all technologies get to porn pretty quickly. So I think right? the most awkward thing with that is going to be um, when you and your spouse put on virtual reality headsets to fool around, and then you accidentally see what your spouse is looking at, and you're like, wait, that's not me. That's not even <laughs> my gender. Maybe we should talk like this. Why would you? I mean, it's selfish to insist that you know you guys have the same fantasy. That there's all kinds of ethical bridges to cross there. Uh, and Oculus, um, Oculus pornography is already like a thing. Like That's there right. are su- there are subreddits that enjoy lots of traffic right now just for virtual reality pornography. I mean, like there are people who are like spending all day long trying to hack that aspect of it. Right. Um, That's one of the things that James Burke said at Strata was. Um, there used to be one form of truth, and it's the version that the ruler needed to enforce to allow things to happen at scale. I'm paraphrasing here. And the Internet lets us have multiple versions of the truth and then debate which ones are true right now. Mm-hmm. And you saw someone like Jimmy Wales saying, no, I will not give equal time to crystals and channeling and healing. There's a good thing and a bad thing about that. You know, One version of the truth is 3D virtual reality pornography, and some people are hacking on that in some subreddit. So to some extent, the Internet lets us explore a lot of potential futures very quickly, much faster than as a species we could before. To another extent, it allows us to explore a lot of futures that either shouldn't or won't or, or, hor- or have horrible consequences in terms of whether they happen. And, you know, to me, the real value, we're just trying, we're ch- we were given the Internet, you know, Twitter is only like six years old, Facebook's only 10 years old, the Internet's, you know, as as a technology goes, you know we've we've got a, sort of gotten our heads around cars. We've gotten our heads around telephones, but the internet just keeps going. Like, and now this is destroyed, and now this is destroyed. And one of the last things that I think's come along is this: um, your grandmother and your uncle that you only see at Thanksgiving now has access because finally the iPhone's really cheap, or they have a cheap Android phone, and. Um, LTE is available in their area and they finally have access to all the information that's right. ever been produced ever, ever, ever. In fact, you know, we're in that, we're in that period of time now where you want to look up something online, like you expect something to be online and you're amazed when it's not there. Right. You found something that isn't listed already. It's amazing. Right. Right. So, and I have a, I believe that it will all eventually get there. Um, so this was in some people's utopian versions of, of how this would play out. Everyone becomes a genius, a Star Trek level genius who only cares about being ethical and moral and um, and and bettering themselves and whatever. But um, in this transitional period, which we're in right now, the real challenge is how do you, what do you do when you're confronted with the ability to confirm everything you already believe? Right. And a lot of people are not handling that very well. I remember uh, the first time that we had smartphones, and I went out with a friend who shall remain nameless because he or she might watch this. And we're in a bar, and this is a person who used to just have the most outlandish stories, and, and they were entertaining, but we all sort of rolled our eyes and they turned around, you know, divide by a hundred kind of stories. And then smartphones came along, and this person had nothing to say at parties, because everybody be like, really? Let me check that. That's not what it says here. And oh, it man. just ruined, this person had to rethink their entire social persona. Yeah, yeah. It, that's, it's sort of a not, not many people are really talking about it, but it is, there, the last few interviews I've done... Uh, people have brought up the idea of new civics and the idea that we um, – there's this great thing where um, sometimes you'll – if you're in any kind of discussion forum, uh, something like Reddit or whatever, where somebody says like uh, – they're talking about a movie like Over the Top and somebody's like, oh, yeah, I've never seen that. And then all of a sudden there's a dog pile of like, you've never seen Over the Top? How could you miss Over the Top? It was this whole thing. How old are you? No, no, you're the same age as me. Why did you not see Over the Top? And that's just rude and mean and, and kind of douchey. But – uh, there's an XKCD comic where he offers a alternative way to go about 
uh, in the, having that conversation play out where he says, well, statistically speaking, if like 90 percent of people have heard of something, that means that a new person learns about it every 10,000 uh, 10, new people learn about it every day. So instead of saying, oh, my God, what's wrong with you? Have you never heard of this? Instead, say, oh, then you must be one of today's lucky 10,000. Right. So that's like a new civics, right? And, uh, and it's weird because it's almost like the pylon is the unpolite up, upvote. That like all your friends are upvoting that you should go see this movie. We just happen to do it belligerently, right? <laughs> right. That, that's a good way to look at it. I like that. Uh, and there are like there, there's a – for almost all of our human interactions that we've moved over to this um, this format, there are – probably better ways of going about interacting with one another that um, take into the fact that we're people and also take into the fact that, that you can help people be better versions of themselves instead of uh, acting like an asshole for whatever they're doing. And on top of that level, on st- and not just new civics, and Burke talked about this and Clive Thompson has said the same thing. Lots of people I've talked to have said the same thing, that um, when you're when you have access to all the world's information, it's not really as important that you are, you personally are, um, have memorized all, all these right. things. It's that you, when you are now presented with the opportunity to go look up something or you're presented with absolutely new information, like a new study comes out or whatever. Um, do you understand how best to go about ingesting that information? Right. Are you aware of critical thinking skills? Do you know what the scientific method is? Um, could you recognize a logical fallacy? Not that you, you, you can't stop yourself from committing it, but can you recognize that you've sure. done it? And this, and, I think that's one of the places where machines, if they're smart, like I would love to have a cognitive bias warning system. <laughs> uh, and, and I did a presentation at, there's this conference I run each year called BitNorth. I did a presentation a couple of years ago about, um, the problem with, uh, searching for an answer instead of search, instead of asking a good question. Mm-hmm. So if I do a search for, vaccines safe i get a million hits and if i get a so a search for vaccines dangerous i get like a hundred thousand it's actually orders of magnitude more than this but you know in my brain a hundred thousand people who agree with me is more than enough for the the wetware at the back of my spine to be happy right right and so it's that idea that that as you just said like when I say, you idiot, how come you haven't seen that movie? It would be great if somebody goes, are you sure you want to say this? Because 17 people have told him that in the last five minutes. You know? And by the way, only 90% have seen it, people have seen it, and you have 240 friends. So there's a chance that this guy is one of the 24 people you don't know. Should you really be yelling quite so loudly? Uh, and it's almost like this, this augmented reality Jiminy Cricket sitting on yeah. your shoulder, right? Augmented, augmented social reality. That, was, that is something that uh, I've... I don't think I've really ever seen really in science fiction um, is the idea that you could have an overlay somewhere that says that that totally takes into the, to account that we are primates who have who cannot stop ourselves from acting, behaving, thinking, deciding and choosing in a certain ways. And that can be augmented. That is that can be amplified, improved. So you did a, a great presentation at Strata. Thank you again on um – survivorship bias and some other cognitive biases. If you're a big company, as you've said, it's fair to predict the future for anyone. If you're a big company, on the one hand, you need to predict the future to understand what's a disruption and what's a distraction. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you're Kodak, turns out you really needed to listen to smartphones, right? You need to pay attention to that field. You didn't know that. Uh, I'm sure there's a dozen other things that you didn't need to pay attention to, and if you focused on them, it was a huge distraction. One way to do that is to sort of suppress the knee-jerk reactionism. You know, I was watching... It's cable news yesterday at the gym. And, like, there's one wall of the screen is just a bunch of tweets flying by, like those old screensavers of, of flying pigs. Like, that's half the, of CNN's screen is just tweets flying by and the <laughs> announcer plucking them from the air like leaves in the autumn. You know, it's just weird. As you said, that's a six-year-old technology. But there's dozens of technologies that aren't on the wall of CNN's screens, right? Um, the challenge for, for large companies is predict the future, predict what is a distraction and what is hugely important. You know, is Oculus Rift a distraction to Facebook or is it the next mobile that could disintermediate their business? And then um, make sure you don't apply whatever baggage and biases you're bringing to your perception of the future. What are the mistakes that large organizations most commonly make when trying to think about the future? Um, well, I think the the one that... Uh I see most often, and this is just based off of what of my re- research in survivorship bias, is that um, a lot of times you're comparing your um, the narrative of your company to the to the storyline of another um, institution, 
or you're comparing the people who are in your institution to the storylines of people who are in other institutions. Uh, or you're trying to bring in people into your company who have interesting narratives. And um, we have this sort of, um, this, we have this inclination to create a good story out of um, the people we know and the institutions that we, uh, that have laid down a history that can be uh, poured over as being a, um, having an arc to it, like a, like a, like a fictional story would have. So you have, you know, the, the underdog who struggles and then against all odds comes up with a crazy idea that no one else has ever had before. And then that they, everyone tells them they're wrong and they fight for that idea. And then they, uh, prove everyone wrong in the end, even though they come this close to losing and everything works out. And now they're a hero. Um, it's that hero with a thousand faces sort of archetypical yeah, yeah. narrative, right? Yeah. Right. And it's, and it's, it's there's, it's, um, uh, you know, my, and this is totally just my speculation. I think that, that, that the, I think that our brains are set up to organize memories that way. And so since that's very pleasing to us to, to remember in that way, we tend to also create fictional stories that follow the model of how memories are laid down, but that could not be true, but that's my speculation. It seems like it would be nice if that was true. Um, but regardless of what is true or what's driving it, that's what we do. That is a, a behavior that happens over and over again. And the problem is that what we tend to do is, um, um, and Kahneman has written about this and, uh, many other people have written about this is that when we look back on the story of a, of a company's progress to success, we tend to believe that it is, it is because these people were geniuses or very inventive or they, um, they had some sort of idea that they fought for and that it all worked out in the end and they knew it would work out in the end. And we believe that they could see the future or that they had, they believed in a version of the future that no one else believed would come true. And then it did for them. But the reality is usually so, so they that, were, they were skating to where the puck was going to be, whether they were doing so inadvertently or intentionally, it was still where the puck was going to be. It was, uh, or, or they are the story we tell is that they knew that they had a, um, they were confident in that that was where the puck was going to sure. be and other people maybe weren't. And, and that's why they win and they don't. Right. But, uh, if you look back on it and, and if, if you look at any kind of psychological research that looks into hindsight bias and that sort of stuff, you find that people really never really don't did not have a vision of the future. It was all chaos in the moment. And it, only when looking back on it, do we, are we then able to paint that narrative of where they were going to be? So is, is um, hindsight bias actually a real bias? Yes, hindsight bias is a real bias. So uh, hindsight bias is – here's the famous study. I forget the researcher who did it, but they had – Nixon was going to China. And they asked a bunch of students, and I think they maybe asked some adults as well, what do you think is he going to do when he goes to China? It was this big event, and lots of people were speculating. Uh, and so these people wrote down, here's what I think he's going to do. They put it in an envelope. They seal it away. Then he goes to China, and it, all the news reports report on it. And then they return to those students many weeks later and say – um, what is, how confident are you that what you predicted would happen is what happened? And they write down the confidence and then they ask, what did you predict would happen? And they write down what they predicted would happen. And of course, what actually played out was they had changed in their mind what they had predicted to match what actually did happen. Right. So, so they forgot they, their predictions flat out. They completely, they replaced the memory of their predictions with what did occur. Have you ever seen the Darren Brown thing where he uh, tricks um, this guy from Shaun of the Dead? I can't remember his name. Oh, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. The Neuro Linguistic Programming? Yeah, yeah, yeah. NLP. I mean, it's a great example of that's not what I wrote. I mean, it right. amazes me people can actually forget, but wow. Yeah, yeah. And so what people seem to be inclined to do is rewrite um, their memories just so that they can maintain a sense of effect of effectance and, uh, and maintain... Um, this positive outlook on their abilities. And so we tend to always believe that we're pretty good at predicting the future because when we look back on the past, we always have been, we don't realize that we're rewriting the past to match whatever happens. So that's hindsight bias. And of course, when they opened up the envelopes, they weren't accurate at all. Uh, uh, what's his name? Um, in the book, um, the righteous mind, uh, Jonathan yeah. Haidt talks about mm -hmm. anybody who's in search of the, uh, anybody who's in search of the truth should stop trying to be right. <laughs> so I'm trying to be right. Yeah, so I'm paraphrasing, but but no, it, no, it's, it's really an issue. It, you know, there's the truth, but as he points out, we evolved to solicit the approval of our peers because that meant we got fed and we didn't get eaten by saber toothed tigers. Not that we evolved to be the correct one, right? Yeah, uh, 
there's a, I was talking to a French researcher who said that he's kind of noticed that in American culture, we, 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 we have a word for arguing. We call argue, arguing is the same thing as bickering to be right. And also trying to come to, to a, um, an agreement that we can both uh, say that maybe you're a little bit wrong. He said that in, in his culture, there are two types of arguing. There's sort of the formal academic um, civilized argument. And then there's the I'm right, you're wrong kind of argument. Right. And that we somehow in American culture have weirdly combined them and there's only one kind of arguing. And if you get on Facebook, you see that all the time, right? Sure. People, people are like, no, this is how it is. And they just want to be right. More, and they don't want to be educated in any way by other people's uh, perspectives. So is that a liability for American businesses, do you think? I think that like you, the real problem is the biggest mind killer, you know, is confirmation bias, right? So, and that's like, we have to develop, all of us, e either at the institutional level or as just individuals, have to develop a, um, have to develop new social skills and new cognitive skills that take into the, take in, in, um, into account that you're going to commit confirmation bias when you're swamped with new information and you have to come up with decisions, blah, blah, blah. Can, can you summarize confirmation bias in 20 seconds or less? Yeah, yeah. So confirmation bias is um, your inclination to, when you have a hypothesis about how you believe the something works or how you believe what you believed is the truth, instead of looking for disconfirmatory evidence first, you seek confir conf confirmatory evidence first. And once you find confirmatory evidence, you be you become satisfied and stop your seeking. So if you are asking if um, our our GMO is bad. And you believe your hypothesis, you won't call it a hypothesis, it's just a belief, it's a gut feeling. I believe they are bad. And then you go to you go out looking to see if whether or not you're right, instead of looking instead of typing into Google uh instances of how GMOs are good, you simply search for how are GMOs bad. You as soon as you find any evidence that confirms your hypothesis, you stop. And that's your comp that's your confirmation bias. It tends to be how we how we build our bookshelves. It tends to be how we pick what TV shows we watch. And over time, we end up creating what they call, you know, the filter bubble, where we just live in a world where everything confirms our beliefs. Uh, yeah, that's that's super bad. That's yeah. In fact, we used to we, we joked about like um, we really need to have um, some kind of. Again, I keep. I guess I think decided that everything in the world is a browser plugin. Um, we really <laughs> need some kind of browser plugin that tells you um, this is, uh, you know, you just search for this thing. Did you know that there's 10,000 searches for the antonym of that thing? So you oh, search yeah. for vaccines are bad, and it goes, here's 10,000 results that show you the vaccines are good. You found 1,000 that say they're bad. Maybe you should consider, you know, like just show right. you the tiebreaker in the sidebar. But, like, but the question is, public service. when you have that, if you were to have that service, would that alter people's behaviors and, and would that alter their decisions? Because the so far, the evidence suggests that and this is the weird, it's the, probably the worst thing you'll ever hear is there's this thing called the backfire effect. And it's something that they just discovered in like 2000, I want to say to, to late 2012. And even though, you know, a lot of things we say we've discovered, we just scientifically quantified for the first time. But um, the, if you give people, if you give people, if you ask people how, what they think, if they have confidence in a news story, and then you give them a, um, a, let me make it very simple. I'm going to make it complicated if I don't. Let's say you ask somebody, were there weapons of mass destruction in Iraq? And they say, yes, I believe there were. And then you hand them a news story that says there were weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. And you ask them to rate on a scale of 1 to 10, how much do you believe that this story is true? And they rate it maybe a 7. And then you hand them a, um, a correction. And you say, actually, that story is not true. There's new information that's come to light. It turns out there were not weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. Then um, you ask them, how do you now feel about the original story? They will now rate it as a, as a higher. It'll go up. So when people receive disconfirmatory evidence, they tend to dig in their heels and believe right. deeper in the original belief instead of going, ah, oh, I was wrong. Um, so that like the, the scientific method and the scientific way of thinking is unnatural, it seems. Yeah. Daniel so, Goroff. So Goroff's a Sloan fellow. I met him at Food Camp a couple of years ago. And he had this great study on energy stuff that, that I'll probably send you after this, um, where they found that let's say you are a um, you measure the energy consumption of someone's house, 
and then you tell that person um, that they are, uh, so one way to motivate people is to not just tell them something, but tell them how they compare to their peers. And so if you tell a person who is consuming a lot of electricity, hey, you're consuming more than your peers, or you tell a person who's consuming a limited amount of electricity, hey, you're doing better than your peers, that's supposed to have a motivating factor. It turned out in this study, uh, and I'm, I'm going to have to look it up after to make sure I'm right, but I believe it was if you told conservatives, Republicans, yeah, right. you were consuming um, less electricity than your peers, they would go out and turn, down the air, turn up the air conditioner. Like they'd say, fine, I'm entitled to more then. And if you <laughs> told Democrats they were consuming more, then they would go like get a more efficient car, right? And so yeah. not only did you have the data on electrical consumption per household, but if you wanted to reduce overall energy consumption, knowing the political leaning of the person that was receiving the note would affect things because you actually didn't want to tell the Republicans they were being good or they'd start getting worse. I, I don't want to throw Republicans under the bus. It was conservative voters versus oh, yeah. liberal sure, voters there's... or whatever. But it, but it was it was really fascinating that like, even when you're armed with the right data, if you use it in what seems like the right way, you can have a huge, hugely deleterious effect on the outcome you're trying to produce. Right. What I use in my talks uh, when I start talking about the, the backfire effect is I use spanking because spanking is kind of apolitical. And... Um, and it doesn't matter which side, uh, like you have a gut feeling as to whether or not you like or dislike spanking. And what's great is that the evidence is kind of ambiguous. I think so, you meant that whether you approve of or disapprove of spanking by parents. You yeah, probably had a different answer if you said, do you like spanking? Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. right. Just for the sake of clarity. Yeah. It, for the purpose of behavioral modification as a, parent, as a parent. That's right. Uh, do you approve or disapprove of spanking? And so, usually people are very strongly for or very strongly against because it's a cultural thing. It's not, a, uh, it's not logical. It's cultural. Uh, if you're from uh, a rural area, from, uh, um, from the deep south, uh, lower socioeconomic status people, they tend to be very, very big in, on spanking. And then um, – uh, people who are from more on the edges of our country and are different cultural backgrounds tend to be against it. And um, the more college education, the more you're against it. So uh, it's you don't really have any control over whether or not you like spanking. You just do or don't coming from a baseline. What's great, though, is that when you present scientific evidence about is spanking effective, uh, it both supports and does not support whatever it is the people believe. It's great. So if you are really, really hate spanking, the evidence kind of says, well, maybe you shouldn't hate it so much because it is effective in certain places. And if you really, really, really are love spanking, the evidence also says, well, maybe you shouldn't because there are all these other methods that are better. Right. So either way, you have That's to the say – perfect thing to study. It's great. Either way, you're, you're going to feel like you're wrong. So what I love to do is you – and you can do this yourself um, – is say, how do you feel about spanking? And then – they, people answer, and then you say, "Well, here's what the evidence says." And uh, I think it's something like uh, it's effective up to age seven if it's uh, you clearly use all these guidelines, and and it's not damaging all this kind of stuff. Um, but at the same time, token economies and all these other methods are far superior. So either way, you get this mixed message of like, "Okay, I kind of was wrong," and then you ask the people, "Well, now how do you feel?" And no matter what, they are more. Uh, in support or more not in support. They keep their position but magnify it. So in the presence of ambiguous information, we just double down on our gut. Exactly. And that's a great example of don't treat – if you're if we're talking about from a – if this is from a uh, running a business or startup perspective, um, you can't treat people like rational agents. You have to accept their humanity. You have to accept that people are irrational and that people are – biological organisms that have all these quirks to them and that people are, um, of course, they're riddled with biases and logical fallacies and heuristics, all this stuff that doesn't make the, that's not saying that people are lesser than human It's saying that they are exactly human. Right. And that, uh, you, when you are managing a corporation, you're managing a decision-making entity. Like corporations are supposed to be, um, a way that we figured out to get a lot of people together to make better decisions sure. than they would than they would alone, um, and that means that what is best about us and what is worst about us is going to be magnified by bringing us all together. And if you have if you if you have this bizarre Spock fantasy of people being purely logical beings, right. that is not going to work. You're going to fail horribly at trying to reach decisions because people don't work that way. In fact, um, and it's become kind of, you may have heard of this before, but there's a, there was this guy who had a, a lesion in his brain that made him a purely logical being. And they studied his decision making and, and they would ask him like, 
uh, I need you to sign up. I need you to fill out this document. Would you like to use a red pen or a blue pen? And that's a 30 minute long decision. Right, right, right. He doesn't, he can't get out of the house because you don't know what kind of pants to put on. He doesn't, he, crazy, if right? you could, as the cereal aisle basically is his hell, right? <laughs> so, so we're not logical beings. Even choosing what color pen is an emotional and irrational choice. And we can, but to some either, extent, that emotion, that rationality allows us to make a quick decision and move on. That, because That's the whole point. And, and yeah. this is one of the challenges, I think, with big companies. Everyone talks about analysis paralysis, whereas a startup, they got nothing to lose, so why not try? Uh, there's a classic example, and I, I, I actually got confirmation of this, confirmation bias. Um, <laughs> so I had heard anecdotally that when PayPal was trying to launch as an online currency, it obviously had competitors, Visa, MasterCard, American Express, and at very least Visa, which is the one I got the real facts on, these companies were not authorized to do business in all 50 states. And I heard that PayPal was still not legal in two states, but they launched anyway because they didn't have the right, you know, I's dotted and T's crossed, but they launched anyway because they had nothing to lose. They had 10 million bucks, whatever their investment was, to lose, whereas Visa, had it launched, um, would have a much harder time launching because it would be um, sanctioned in the two states where it wasn't legal. Right, so they had a lot to lose. They could lose their over-the-counter swipe credit card swiping sales immediately. Um, a guy who worked at Visa at the time told me that it was actually 17 states that PayPal was legal in. So Visa is never going to say we're going to launch a business that's only been approved by less than half of the state legislators, mm -hmm. but PayPal could say, yeah, sure, we're going to do it. Right, and as a result, PayPal was they simply had too much to lose. Where and and so the analysis paralysis of sitting there and going, oh, we can't possibly do this. There's these downsides, there's these con consequences. You know, We're trying to do uh, risk avoidance rather than revenue maximization. Uh, we're trying to um, spend more time uh, arguing for our current business model. All these factors, I think it's a fascinating example of like what is it that made PayPal willing to take that risk? Some of it is monetary, right? Mm -hmm. But if you think about how much money Visa left on the table by not being the default currency of the internet, that's an interesting debate to have, right? And, right. and, and I think one, you mentioned at the beginning that we're upending a lot of business assumptions every six, um, every six years. You know, Twitter's brand new. Some of these aren't fundamental ups, upendings. You and I are talking by face. Facial conversation hasn't changed in millennia. Uh, we drive cars. That's 50 years. We now know pretty well what they are. So there's the big tides of history. You know, language-based facial communication, driving by vehicles. And then there's the short tides, which are sort of Hey, that's Skype, that's neat, but it's really just enabling something we've known how to do for millennia. And it seems to me like um, big organizations need to be able to parse the short-term disruptions and look at the longer-term sort of tides and blend those two. And that's a really hard problem because okay, if you yeah. just go based on, hey, that's new and disruptive and has a lot of attention right now, without thinking about how it plays into a fundamental human need, safety, security, affinity, communication, you know, uh, position in the tribe, it may not have the long life that you're hoping it, it has to bet your company on. Well, you, were, you asked earlier about the talk I gave with, uh, at, a, at the O'Reilly Strata conference. And um, my, from, you know, my advice is, like very simply, that you need to have a plan in your organization for how you deal with chaos. Um, and the research suggests that individual human beings who have, who interact with chaos in a certain way, um, are the, what we call lucky and other types of people interact with it in a different way or what we call unlucky. And, um, when you look back on the track record of any company, what was the driving force behind all their success was luck, uh, not skill, not intelligence, not acumen, not, um, insight, not genius. Those things are all important. They aren't usually what is the, what, I mean, what usually happens is an aggregate is luck, but luck is, um, what I said in the lecture was that there luck is, the way most people see luck is through pre-scientific thinking. Um, it's like looking at the sky as constellations before you know what stars are. That's a pre-scientific way of looking at, it. uh, luck. There's a post-scientific understanding of luck and the literature is all out there. Anyone who's interested can look up Richard Wiseman did, has done 10 years of research into it. And what he basically found were that lucky people fail a lot and have this attitude of when they fail, they don't really think about it. They're just like, well, I fail, whatever, and they move on. Um, and when they enter into new situations, they are not goal-oriented. They are opportunity-oriented. So they, they, 
they go to, as he puts it, they go to a party not hoping to find the love of their life. If that happens, that's great. But if they meet some cool people that they are interested in, you know, paintball or something, or they meet some people who are, um, who are working on this project they'd like to be part of, that then becomes why they went to that party in hindsight. Right. And, they don't, and they don't feel like they failed at finding their um, true love. So hindsight bias is a, is a necessary condition for luck. And to bring things full circle, um, maybe Facebook's acquisition of, of uh, Oculus is, is a form of luck, right? They're just being opportunistic. And, and th- they'll convince themselves there was a good reason, just like when they bought WhatsApp <laughs> and people started right. writing these articles about, wow, it looks like it's really cheap per engaged user. Or, hey, this is the aggregate value of all SMS traffic around the world, and they just bought that for a fraction of the price. Or, hey, look, Daniel Kahneman says, like, uh, a stupid decision that works out becomes a brilliant decision in hindsight. Right. So, so right now, all these people are trying to predict the future and say, "Oh, they're just trying to put, uh, you know, ads in our brains, and um, they're trying to um, widely in this space." And maybe if uh, if it works out in ten years, we'll all think it was brilliant. But if they're making this decision as just a, I don't know what's going to happen. I just have a whole lot of money, and I'm going to throw it at this thing and see if they make something cool out of it. That's not actually a bad business decision uh, if you're if you're familiar with the idea of let's throw ourselves at chaos and let luck prevail if we have the power because they, Facebook has the power to fail for Oculus right. like it, that that's the powerful thing in this deal is that now it's not a, as much of a problem for Oculus to make bad decisions right uh, they can now although, although there is a certain amount of um, I mean we talked earlier about skating where the puck's going to be. A lot of times, people people forget that the puck is the puck is related to you. So when you skate towards the puck, sometimes the puck moves away. Sometimes the puck <laughs> is attracted towards you. Right? We have this myth that the future is heading somewhere and we can't shape it. Um, there's a great quote by uh, John Foreman who wrote uh, Data Smart. He has this great expression: um, algorithms that shit where they eat. <laughs> And he talks about the Chicago Police Department, and he says they have this thing where it shows you neighborhoods and crime rates, right? Well, what happens is if I show you a neighborhood with a high crime rate, you move out, the house values go down, there more people is. move in, the cops go there because of what they see as in leading indicators of crime, more crime happens, and so on. This is an algorithm that shits where it eats. Yeah. And we forget, I think, that we have this idea of the puck as this independent entity that's going somewhere without our input, when in fact, uh, you know, undoubtedly, Facebook bought Oculus because it is a leader in the field of consumer-grade virtual reality. But by buying Oculus, Facebook has fundamentally changed what consumer-grade virtual reality means. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So when you know this, if you're a big enough mover, if you're like GE and you make a, a big move in an industry, wind turbines or train engines or whatever, you shape the puck and the puck shapes you. And I think this, this idea we have that we're mythically skating towards a puck that's good. I like is, that. Is something completely wrong, right? And, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and it's very hard to analyze when I do this. Like, what, did Facebook sit down and go, when I do this, what will that... There's now all these stories about makers wanting their money back. Like, I bought one of the first Oculuses, and I have... I now own a Facebook device. That's weird, <laughs> right? Um, so I think this issue of companies being able to anticipate the future and plan for it, at the one end of the spectrum is this sort of Vulcan, I have a, I've, I've viewed all the quantum threads in the universe and I know where it's going, independent of us, and I want to do the right things, right? At the other end is the future is just this messy pile. We are, you know, we are simply bags of meat running on jungle surplus <laughs> hardware. And somewhere yeah, in the middle yeah. is the truth, right? Yeah. And how does, how does the CEO tell the board that when they want certainty? And, and that's, well, I mean, like the... You have to deal with people as people, and we can. If the CEO may know in his heart everything you just said, but that's not going to fly with the board. So uh, that's not what you say to the board. <laughs> like you, 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 you talk to the board like people who are skeptical of all these things. Um, I, but I think it it is healthy, and we have to accept if you're the head of anything that you cannot predict the future. Uh, not even great. Not many people whose job it is to predict the future ever predict the future correctly. When they do, we look back and go, oh, well, you, you, work, you got that one right. Uh, so any, any, uh, I think any business plan or model that is built on solely being confident in your future predictions is recipe for failure. It should be more about how you deal with um, chaos, how you deal with randomness, how you deal with chance, and are you setting yourself up to take 
advantage of opportunities that arise in that kind of scenario. Um, and I'm not, I mean, I'm not telling people anything they haven't heard from somebody else before, but that's, that is just the way it is. Like, uh, I don't place much faith in the human's ability to predict the future. So, um, and I wouldn't recommend that as a business strategy. Awesome. Uh, thanks a bunch, man. And, um, yeah, let's, let's, let's figure something out. Sure. All sure. right, man. Take care.